Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is safe and well, and welcome to our speaking event today about health entrepreneurship and how to really make an impact. My name is Kaveh Khushnud. I'm an associate professor at Yale School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology of Microbial Diseases, and I'm the faculty director for Innovate Health Yale, a social entrepreneurship program at our School of Public Health. Our featured guests today are Roger Barnett, a Yale College alumnus from the class of 1986 and a Yale Law School alumnus from the class of 1989. Roger is the chairman and CEO of Shankly Corporation. We also have Chris Larson, who's the co-founder and executive chairman of Ripple. Chris and Roger are leaders in their industries and we are excited to have them here today. They have partnered together to make generous gifts that help launch the School of Public Health's Rapid Response Fund early, early on in the COVID-19 pandemic. Those funds have provided critically needed funding to researchers working on pandemics frontline. I'm now going to let our two other discussion hosts introduce themselves, Howie and Fatima. Howie? Thanks, Kavi, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming here and for our guests, Chris and Roger. I really appreciate you joining us for this. I'm Howie Foreman. I'm a, a practicing diagnostic radiologist and also the director of the healthcare management program in the School of Public Health, and I teach health policy in Yale College, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Fatima. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Fatima Basre. I'm the Assistant Director of Innovate Health Yale and the Innovation Manager for our Sustainable Health Initiative. And uh, really excited to lead this conversation with Roger and Chris and uh, Kaveh and Howie as well. So Roger, Chris, thank you so much again for joining us and taking time out of your very busy schedules. Uh, we'd really like to get started and kind of hear a little bit about each of your personal career journeys. Uh, so my first question is, what is the story of your professional career? And uh, how, how would you best describe the work that you do today? Uh, either one of you, feel free to jump in. Roger, go for it. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Fatima. Thank you, uh, by the way, everyone for both watching and for what you do in the field of public health. Um, it is never been more important. Um, and so for you to devote your time and energies to that is a great gift to all of us. So I think if I were to describe my, my journey of my career, it is a journey, uh, a kind of meandering, wandering one that at the time, I just did things that I was passionate about and they seemed fairly random, but looking back, they all fit into a pattern. And uh, at the end of the day, What's driven me through that is sort of a curiosity, uh, an element of science and a desire to help people. So when I was in high school, between high school and college, I went and I lived in the bush in Africa to do animal behavior research. And then I studied wheat genetics in Israel. And I spent my senior year at Memorial Sloan Kettering doing uh, work on leukemia research. And then I, and then I, flipped a little bit. I was actually in New Haven um, when I was at the law school and an alumni named Bill Drayton came. He founded an organization called Ashoka and he talked about this idea of social entrepreneurship and he coined that term. And um, it was really a pivotal moment for you. So I encourage you, by the way, to go to different lectures uh, while you're in, in New Haven, take advantage of them because you never know when somebody's going to give you an idea that really motivates and inspires you. And I think the question there was to, to sort of segment out between uh, uh, NGO, nonprofit work and profit work. And there are these two distinctions of these different worlds. And the question really is, how do you make an impact? And being able to have the same characteristics as a private sector entrepreneur, vision, charisma, persistence, um, but just for a public sector goal, 
is how he defines social entrepreneurship. And again, I've seen this distinction between NGOs and for-profit collapse a little bit. And I know we'll talk about that later in the session, but it got me going into a journey of saying, okay, I'm gonna go into business and use that as a vehicle to change. And, um, and, and being an optimist and somebody who wants to make an impact, I sort of looked in the good in everything I did. So I started in the beauty business and I'm like, well, I'll make people feel good about themselves and that's good. And then eventually I got into the health business, which is the business that I have now. It's a, one of sort of the pioneer of the nutritional supplement industry, but it uses a peer to peer network, our company to educate people about healthier choices and decisions and delivers convenient product solutions to both make people and our planet healthier. Um, and once you're involved in health, you realize how transformative that is. Um, and I've been doing that for the last 16 years. And, um, and so when I look back, my, my, my uh, time where I was doing these little scientific things helped me work with our research and development scientists and understand how to interact with them. My travel internationally allowed me, we have a global business today with 2 million people around the world that represent us, allowed me to, to understand the common elements between humans. And then, um, and then but centrally at health, I, I, just, I just feel before the pandemic, we, we had to maybe make an argument uh, or explain why it was central. I've been talking about the centrality of health for, for, for decades, but, but right now it needs no explanation. And I think it has, it has created incredible opportunities um, and incredible challenges. And with all these challenges and disruptions creates a lot of opportunities. So anyway, um, uh, I'll let Chris speak because he has an incredibly interesting, um, Chris is one of the great entrepreneurs that I know. And um, I think you'll enjoy hearing from, from him. Oh, well, thanks, Roger. Uh, Roger's a dear friend, just a, a fantastic guy, and, and just an honor to be on the same screen as him. Uh, I wish we could be in person. Uh, and I also wanted to thank uh, Yale for all the great work that they've done. You guys really stepped up here with this crisis, this pandemic. And uh, you, you know, you, you showed great results for uh, you know the relatively modest amounts of money that it takes to to get things rolling. So, tremendously appreciate everything you guys have done. Um, so, a little bit on my background. So, uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, I've really been focused in the in the financial technology area. We like fintech a lot uh, because we really see you know kind of the access to finance as being one of those one of the three core things that determines whether or not you're successful in the world today, right? It's really, and it really is around access to healthcare, uh, access to education and access to finance. I mean, I think, I think those are really basics and you've had a real problem in the world of finance uh, around access and around cost and around fairness. And so we always thought with the, the advent of the internet that that was gonna fundamentally break down uh, these barriers. I think what we found out actually is finance was kind of one of the slowest areas to kind of evolve. Uh, the first dot-com wave, you saw applications develop, but they were really trapped in individual countries. U.S., you know, it was different than Europe or, or, or Japan, for example. The thing that's really exciting now is I think we're seeing the first kind of waves of kind of a, uh, what we call an internet of value, kind of globalized uh, finance um, through the web. A lot of that's being driven by blockchain and obviously the company uh, that I, you know, just, <laughs> I'm so excited about, obviously Ripple is, uh, is just that. It's uh, involved in kind of the global uh, kind of reordering of infrastructure around finance. And at its highest level, we sort of see this as completing globalization, kind of the third leg of the stool, right? So globalization doesn't work unless you have a global infrastructure for data, for goods. We have that obviously with the internet and data. We have that with you know, kind of globalized shipping. You can ship a, a shirt clear across the world now for four cents, that's awesome. But until now you didn't have that for, for money and finance. And we think that is kind of really what uh, blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies really represent. The other thing uh, that we like about FinTech is it's really complex, right? So you actually have to weave together three completely different disciplines, technology, capital markets, and compliance and regulation. All three of those things are complex. All three work on different cycles. 
Uh, and in our opinion, that, that provides a ton of opportunity because it's really hard. It also provides a ton of difficulty and complexity. And for, for people that are keeping up on the news and the uh, current events, you know, you, you know that Ripple is, is now involved in a really intense fight with one of our uh, key regulators, the SEC, on how you define a currency or a security. We think it's a really important fight. Uh, and, you know, in some ways it's frustrating because this was already made clear, you know, the, the currency that we use was made uh, clear that it was just that a currency by Obama's treasury in 2015, five years ago. And this thing has operated for, for eight years now. But I think it's an example of how uh, a lot of these technologies and this healthcare and in finance kind of move well ahead of where uh, policy and regulation is. So those sometimes are fights, uh, hopefully you work together, but sometimes a fight is necessary and uh, we're very confident about our position there. But it's exciting in that way. The other thing I would say is that, and I'll stop in a second here, we love infrastructure plays. So I think the, the world really needs that. So there's lots of ways you can contribute but setting up a new infrastructure that will enable billions of people to participate at very low cost in finance or in healthcare, we love that kind of stuff. And I'd also give, you know, as people ask for advice sometimes in starting businesses, um, don't forget about enterprise. A lot of times we just focus on the consumer because it's kind of right in front of us, but there's so much going on kind of below the surface in enterprise. And that's what we're focused on as well. So we, we like that. And it took me a while to learn that. My first two companies were consumer focus. Anyway, I'll stop there. But again, really, really excited to be here. And thanks for all you guys, uh, what you guys are doing. Thank you so much, Chris and Roger. Um, great insight. So my next question is, what does health entrepreneurship mean to you? Maybe I'll start with this one. So the, the definition of an entrepreneur is, is actually technically somebody who owns their own business. That's kind of the, and, and it's used as a phrase, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial is used as also kind of like a mindset. So within our company, for example, I keep trying to get all of our employees to, to think in an entrepreneurial way. And, and um, I use that a lot. And then people are like, well, what does that really mean? And I think it's a question of, of acting in a way as if you owned the business business where you basically, instead of when you see a, a problem, uh, you don't just identify the problem, you try to figure out a solution for it and be proactive about that. And I think in our healthcare system, right, we're going through massive change. I think that the dialogue, it's only really recently that the concept of equity in our healthcare system or the inequity, the structural disparities in health outcomes and how we cannot have an equal and just society without having equal access to the same kind of healthcare. And it starts with all these social determinants as well. So it's a whole ecosystem of how to get it there. Um, our healthcare system in the United States, right? We're number one in terms of absolute dollars. We're number one in terms of GDP. We're like 26th in delivery, you know, behind Costa Rica. Uh, and so there's something very wrong. I think, I think in part it is, um, there's the inefficiencies of the system. I think in part, there's too much focus on waiting till people get sick and not enough on prevention. Um, and so this dialogue now with the pandemic has just shone such a bright spotlight on, on inequities and also structural challenges in our system that it creates very substantial opportunities, okay? And the lens that I come from it, and everybody has their own angle, there's, there's, there's tremendous work that's being done through computational biology and other aspects of figuring out drug therapies and interventions and understanding and modeling and computing power and all that about how our bodies work. My lens is how do you engage, as Chris was saying, you know, millions of people, tens of, of millions of people into living a healthier life. That requires education, which is an information one. And I think that's so important. The, 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 the internet science and the real science is diverging. 
okay? And I, I believe very strongly in the role of the public health institutions in our country to communicate clearly with science-based, evidence-based information about choices and things uh, uh, in that way. And then the next part is that people are, are, are just beginning to focus on the power of the peer-to-peer -peer communication between consumers. So our whole business depends on somebody who has um, been, been exposed to good things about how to take care of their health and sharing that knowledge and products to other people peer-to-peer, -peer, consumer to consumer. And I think trying to engage consumers in this dissemination of information is just beginning to start. And again, I, I know that some of the alumni or awards that are being given from this Innovative Health are doing fantastic things in different parts of the world. It's really incredible to see what they're doing. So I think the concept of owning a solution to problems in a world where everything is being disrupted and reevaluated creates enormous opportunity for impact. And whether you're private sector, public sector, I'm gonna talk later, I think that line doesn't matter. You wanna be self-funding. You have to create enough value that you don't have to rely on philanthropy to survive. And I think that is a model where you can increase your impact over time because you're self-funding and self-reliant. And in order to do that, you have to provide a value or a service that's not needed. And again, I think the lines blur between whether you're an NGO or a private sector one. But so anyway, that's health entrepreneurship, I think is one of the categories that if you were to be an entrepreneur today, there's so much room to do it on a global basis and not only uh, create value, but, but um, economic value, um, but, but impact. Yeah, there's something I kind of want to piggyback on what, what Roger's saying there. Um, this idea that things are kind of <clears throat> jumbled up right now. And you could say, well, you could be kind of be afraid of that, right? It's like, well, everything's just chaotic and there's just too much going on. But there's a tremendous amount of power in that, right? And I think that's why I'd be really optimistic about how things are going to play out going forward. And if you're, if you're uh, just starting out today, I think why you have so much more opportunity than anybody's had, you know, in history. Um, so kind of starting businesses, you know, it's a for-profit business, but there's tons of room to be doing social impact at the same time. And I think every company should be moving in that direction. And I think they are, right? So, you know, we have a social impact arm built in uh, to our company. We, uh, we kind of think about product market fit, both from profit and from uh, is gonna do good in the world, right? So you could kind of mix all those things together. And I think for entrepreneurship in health, it's the same as entrepreneurship anywhere. Um, you're, you're mixing again, <clears throat> the ideas around data science and being very focused on data and trying to be you know, super uh, pragmatic about that. But at the same time, you're taking all these leaps of faith. Um, what I like is this idea, and this is what, you know, you've got everything at your fingertips now, right? Kind of wandering around, go into a subject, wander about, um, and and you know, the idea there is you know, we, when we start our business, we always talk about you're wandering in the desert, right? So hopefully you have enough water where you're not gonna die in the desert. Um, so you have to be somewhat focused and face the harsh reality. But at the same time, you can kind of uh, just explore and piece these things together. And then when you find something, and when I say find something, not just because of the data shows it, but because it grabs something inside of you and you just sort of know this is a nugget I gotta dig on go for it. Don't be afraid that the data is not there. Um, there are just tons of things that become really successful where it's not obvious what the product market fit is for some time. And, and, and I think, you know, a lot of venture capitalists say, well, I got a product market fit and all that. That's hogwash. Just throw, throw that out for the first couple of years, just wander around and then you get to your, you know, hopefully get your product market fit before your, you know, C round. Um, but you don't need it right away. And I think that's, that's uh, really powerful. So, the trick there, of course, is ignoring the advice of people you respect, right? So it's learning from your elders, learning from these geniuses, that's the data side, but don't go too far with that, right? You got to ignore uh, the common conclusion, otherwise things never progress, right? So you should feel free to, to be that way. Thank you so much, I, I, I love that. Oh, go ahead. I'm Chris. So that's a that's why Chris is a real disruptive entrepreneur, right? It's it's actually really hard to follow that and ignore what other people are doing to see something. And I think 
I think Chris has had the fortitude and the confidence to be able to to go on an independent track. I just want to say for our audience to make sure that everybody understands what product market fit is. Um, for some of you who may not experience it, it's a phrase which is widely used in Silicon Valley um, to sort of say when you're starting a business, how do you know that the product or service that you're creating, there's actually a demand. So you can sit in your dorm room or your room and you can dream up an idea, but it doesn't mean necessarily that anybody's willing to pay for that service or it's solving a problem. And so venture capitalists will often say, you know, show me evidence of a product market fit. And Chris's, you know, kind of counterintuitive advice there is say, take your time a little bit of it. If you really have passion and conviction on it, go, go, go figure it out. Right. And you can, you can wander for a while. And, and a lot of the companies that you see today that are right. That one of the insights that I learned is, Google and Facebook, they didn't start all start out with what they eventually became. So um, there's a lot of pivoting that goes on in it and evolves over time. So you start with one insight and you may end up, you know, 10 degrees or 20 degrees differently, or you may end up 180 degrees differently from that. Um, but again, I think in this area of the field of health, which everybody's part of it, there's plenty of room to start, innovate, pivot, and figure out, but at some point you will sort of have to make sure that your service are, is filling a demand and a need for it. And that's what, for those that aren't as steeped in the language of startups, that's, I just wanted to explain that to people. No, that, that's really a great point. Um, if I, one more nugget, which I, I always try to latch onto this important, Silicon Valley uses word disruption a lot. Uh, and I've actually learned to hate that word because it's a negative word. It's like breaking stuff, right? And I think we all know kind of move fast to break things. That probably doesn't work all that well in healthcare or in finance, right? Maybe in, in gaming and that sort of thing. So we like to think of it in terms of being builders rather than disruptors, because that's always good. And that that actually plays better in many parts of the world as, where, as well, where disruption probably doesn't sound like a good thing. Thank you guys. That was really, really insightful. And as I'm looking at the attendees, I see so many um, current Innovate Health Yale uh, award winners, past and present watching. So this question um, I'm hoping will be of interest to, um, to them and to the rest of our audience. So what do each of you look for in an investment and what are some current areas of interest for you? Chris, why don't you start? Um, sure. Um, so, uh, and again, kind of combining uh, some of the for-profit with uh, philanthropic. Um, so some of the areas that we're really focused on right now, uh, refugee uh, solutions. Uh, my wife was a refugee. So we're, we're really focused on uh, how can we encourage innovative approaches to the refugee crisis. Never been more refugees in the world than we have today. And there's never been more, more closed doors. Um, so we actually have a competition going on, you know, to find what are the new innovative solutions that should get funding. And, you know, we've committed $10 million to that. And hopefully then that will lead to others contributing uh, once we, we find the kind of winners or a winner of that competition. And we can talk a little bit about competitions and philanthropy as well. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, that is kind of one route we think is, is, is pretty helpful. Um, other areas are in eye issues, so sort of glaucoma, particularly in some of the poorer parts of the world. We like that one because that's a real problem. People go blind and it fundamentally changes your lives, holds back families, and it's actually really easy to solve at very little cost. It's kind of like the malaria problem. Um, you know, I know many of you might be aware, but you know, a thousand people are dying every day of malaria. You could probably solve that for five bucks on uh, malaria nets. Um, so th those are areas. Um, a big area is also around climate change. Um, and the thing we're looking for there is things that can scale big enough to solve the problem. So we love, we love mineralization. Um, and we also like the mineralization, you know, because you can get up to gigatons of carbon uh, captured and put away forever and things like aggregates and, and that sort of thing. Um, and that's a, that's a big need. We can't just go to neutral, we have to get to negative. But the other thing we like about that is there's lots of projects that have decent ROIs. So they could be for-profit, some of them can be philanthropic, 
but they're kind of being shunned by traditional VCs and green tech. And it's because those VCs were burned, you know, 15, 10, year, 10 15 years ago by that first wave of, uh, wave of uh, green tech investing, unless you invested in Tesla, obviously. Um, so too many of the green tech VCs are just focused on sort of software and data uh, and electrification. And they're kind of staying away from the so-called heavy stuff. Uh, like aggregates and concrete and, uh, and the, the only thing that could scale at that level. So we like that just because it's kind of ignored. So there's a, uh, a social impact element to that, but they also have pretty decent, you know, futures and economically. Um, so that's a, that's an area we like as well. Roger. Sure. So um, the general criteria uh, for me is impact and scale uh, and sustainability. So those are the three things. And when I say sustainability, I'm not referring to environmental sustainability alone as an attribute. It's, it's is, is this scalable impact thing sustainable on its own? And I think um, if you wanna make a, a meaningful difference. I'm really trying to make a meaningful difference again in the tens of millions of people, if not hundreds of millions of people. And so that's the scale component to it. And the sustainable part of it is kind of a requirement uh, in that. I just, it's where my mind goes. I just believe in the power of business models to fund change. And uh, my passion is, is, is marrying the two, marrying the impact with the benefit of a, of, a, of a sustainable business model at the same time. And then the other part of it is the entrepreneur. You know, um, What I've learned um, from, from um, uh, investing, at the end of the day, the idea can be great. Uh, the business can be great. But if the entrepreneur is not great, it doesn't work. And um, sometimes, actually, one of my one of my more successful investments was I uh, when Chris started his company. I didn't even know what it was that he was going to do, but I just had a philosophy of supporting friends and and um, and then other ones. I prayed over the investment and did the theory, and they just didn't pan out as well. So you got to find a great entrepreneur, you know. You and and if you're looking to raise money as a innovate health thing. Um, I think the successful entrepreneur is the one that understands the essential part of value creation of that business. Let me see if I can provide a little more color. There's an overwhelming amount of stuff that will come your way, whether it's, um, and, and there's an infinite amount of choices, okay, of what you do in your business. But there's only a very, very, very small number of things that you must do right in order to create the value. And if you don't do them, nothing else matters. And I find very the great entrepreneurs are the ones that understand intuitively what that is and are relentlessly focused on moving the needle on that particular KPI, whatever that metric is and not getting overwhelmed and distracted by all the other stuff that is nice to have, but fundamentally irrelevant in achieving the impact. And that, I don't know how, I, I'm trying to say, well, if I was listening to the audience, how would I know how to get that, right? How, how would I do? And I think it, maybe it's just, you know, I believe in writing things out as well. Shorter is better. Like it's harder to write something short than it is to write something long. So like, on, on one page, what what's the impact right, that I want to have? And Amazon uses this technique whenever they do a product launch or any kind of, they, they make people before they fund a project, they make them write the press release of what would happen if success. It's just a, a, a technique to say, what does success look like? So make sure you know what success looks like, right? And then, then, then before you get involved in all the ideas, what are the one, two, maximum, three things that will lead to that outcome. And just put them, if you have a desktop, laptop, computer, whatever, on your phone, put them in, put them so you're staring at them every day and you don't get sidetracked and you just make sure you're, 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 you're working on progressing those things. Thank you both. Um, and we will keep the conversation going with Howie jumping on. 
Hi, thanks uh, for keeping the conversation going. This has been great to listen to. Um, <clears throat> You know, it, it, one of the things that strikes me is that both of you are enormously successful. And since you're roughly my age, I would also say that you're quite young. Um, and so it makes me think of like, you know, um, you know, what I think about even for my career, what do I want to do in the next 10 years? And, and how do I judge my own success um, given where you are right now. You're both very successful. And if you did nothing else for the rest of your lives, you'd be very successful. But how accountable do you hold yourselves to moving the ball down the field, to use a sports analogy? Um, how do you judge yourself? What are you thinking about? What do you want to look back in 10 and 20 years and, and feel like you accomplished? And I could start with Roger or Chris, whoever wants to go first. Um, so, uh, I think this is fundamental. I have, I, I have discovered that my level of happiness and satisfaction in life is very tied to the level of impact that I'm having. That's what drives me as a human being. I'm just motivated to do an impact at scale. So my measure of success is, you know, Am I involved in something and channeling my energy, my experience, my passion, whatever assets that I have um, into making a transformational impact? And, you know, there's the personal side, which is, you know, I'm married, I have three children, you know, what are my relationships within my family? Um, and you can only be happy if those are in a good shape too. But but in from a career perspective, the impact is is really my yardstick. And there's various points of time in my career where I'm making a smaller impact or a bigger impact. And and I just keep trying to figure out how to keep going to scale more uh, of it. And uh, it's a never-ending journey for me. It's it's a it's a quest that will never have an ending to it, but you know, you start with what you do, then the question is, who do you have influence? And I, I always sort of said that um, one of the great influences is convening power. Mm -hmm. who, do you have the ability to convene like-minded people or people who can move uh, through the combination of whatever they do in their life? And there's a, there's a question in the chat about networking, you know, very interesting, I went to Yale for college and law school, I went to Harvard for business school. I never did business with anyone that I went to school with until only recently. And so the network there wasn't really a business network for me, but there are, there, the, the, the advantage of a network is that so many large institutions can move things. So if you think of, of if you wanna make a change on something, the ability to convene people, I was interested in the School of Public Health. Sten, awesome, great job in doing it. He came up with this rapid response fund. I called Chris. Like, Chris, this is super interesting. High impact, high ROI, 100 times ROI investment on changing something, right? But it's the power to convene people that, 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 that you can do something with. So trying to figure out a problem that you're committed to, trying to be able to to, to get to know others who can help share the impact. I know that's, that's kind of what I'm just keep trying to elevate over time. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it obviously changes uh, with where you are in life. Right. So, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, the first thing that motivated me, you know, my first business uh, was kind of frankly, the need for respect. You know, I, I felt like my uh, father wasn't respected as a super hardworking guy that kind of never really, you know, advanced the way he maybe should have, you know, he was an airline mechanic, uh, you know, a union guy. Um, and, you know, that created a lot of kind of personal, like, I don't know, anger or something like that. And, but I think what's important there is like that did help. So I think for someone starting out, you kind of use what you have to, to motivate you. And if it's, ang you know, you're angry at somebody, you're angry at the world, or if you feel like you're not being respected enough, great, you know, kind of use, to, kind of, to try to be constructive about it, right? That can obviously go in the wrong direction. But that was, uh, that was the chief motivator, frankly, for a long time. Now it's very different, obviously, because, I, you know, uh, 
you know, have what I need and I have kids and now it's very much on how would my kids look at my, you know, my life, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Um, but that with a nice thing there, I think that's pretty aligned with kind of what you need to be doing in the world on impact and contributing. Um, it's kind of the great thing about having kids. It's pretty, it's pretty pure. Um, and it's pretty aligned with, you know, they are the future. So uh, in the philanthropic work and, and also in the company work, that is definitely the, the focus. And, and, you know, if, you know, when, when I leave this earth, you know, how, how, how I, you know, how I be looked at, uh, you know, I, I think a bit, another part is kind of, did you make good on what you promised your team, team members? Uh, and that includes your, your, your investors, your employees, everybody in your family. Um, you know, did they, uh, did you, uh, did you come through for them? Did you handle setbacks with grace? Uh, I think those are kind of the key measures. Um, I'm going to combine some of the uh, questions from the chat with some other ideas about, you know, what, you know, what would you recommend to either your younger self or any of our students? I'm really pleased to see it in addition to, as Kave mentioned, so many of our innovative health students, we have a lot of our healthcare management students or health policy students, many of our alums on this call. And as Sten pointed out, this is just an amazing turnout for both of you. What would you tell your younger self? What are the skills and strategies you would recommend be acquired by our current students? What, uh, and in Roger's case, since, since he went to Yale, you know, what were some of the greatest lessons you learned while you were at Yale? And for Chris, what were the greatest lessons that maybe you didn't use right out of college um, or even business school, but that you came to appreciate later on, maybe decades later? And I'll start with Chris this time. Sure. Um, so I think back at kind of key influences, uh, one individual stands out, uh, you know, uh, Jim Collins, he was an entrepreneurship instructor, uh, teacher at a Stanford Business School. He always used to say, you know, cut the lifeboats. It's like, you know, like uh, students, you know, in the same uh, at Yale and, and Stanford, you know, we're so fortunate. Um, look, you have like zero risk profile. Like if you start something and fail, it's like, who cares, right? In fact, in, in, in today's world, I think people have gone through failures sometimes or more sought after for kind of the next investment. So I think we way, way over, uh, overestimate our risk profile uh, as, as young adults uh, with the kind of mind power, the kind of connections that, you know, everybody here has, right? So I think that's the one thing and I would, I would take that way back earliest, you know, early as I could in my life when I was, you know, even 15 or, you know, started a business then, um, but that didn't come until late twenties, right? So I think that's, uh, that's really, really important. I think in starting a business, it's like, okay, are you starting a product or are you starting a culture, right? And I would definitely weigh towards culture. And I know that's a little bit more, that's a little more difficult in healthcare because uh, so much is kind of focused on the actual solutions, the science of the solutions. But I think if you look out there, kind of all the really successful organizations, they really build great cultures and those cultures can then, you know, kind of make a pivot, they can adjust, the world is changing so fast, right? Um, that's probably more valuable than, you know, kind of focus on a product that might completely change and new, new competitors and that sort of thing. The other thing I do think having a co-founder is really important, but only one co-founder. I don't, I don't, don't th you know, three co-founders is like 3D chess, it's just impossible, right? Um, and make sure you're really clear about, you know, who's, uh, who is a co-founder and who's an employee, right? If it's a co-founder, you're equals and you have equal share. Don't donate this nonsense with, you know, one co-founder has this and one co-founder has that. Uh, and uh, and if, if not, then, you know, they're an overpaid employee, right? So be really clear about that, right? And, and set up your organizations super early. Don't wait too long, right? So those are all uh, kind of important things. And raise money when you can, right? Like this is a phenomenal fundraising environment we're in today. It can change in a blink of an eye. So you raise when you can. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say my friend Jonathan Rothberg has a, a cartoon that he throws up whenever he gives a talk that says, please God, just one more bubble. So, 
Roger. Well, I think, I think um, my advice would be first get to know yourself, okay? Figure out what motivates you and will, what, what you're striving for, because you're gonna put a huge amount of time and energy into anything that you do. And you have to, I think, be self-aware. So Chris was talking about respect as a motivation. Mine was sort of early days about impact. Some other people might be, they wanna make money. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different, and, and I think there's different pathways depending upon what motivates you. So you really have to get a clear sense of, if, if you're unclear about some of your fundamental primary motivations, I encourage you to spend some, a lot of time thinking about it. Okay, that'd be number one. I think the second thing is that there are, I think, two fundamental pathways to go down. And I, no one ever talked about this when I was, you know, starting out. There's an institutional pathway and an entrepreneurial pathway. And institutions are incredibly powerful. When I talk about institutions, I'm talking about large companies, um, uh, uh, large academic institutions, big multilateral organizations, right, from it. They have the power, and along with it comes a platform, and it comes a certain level of respect and prestige, and and, and, and scale of resources in order to both convene and make an impact. So institutions require time. In other words, you can be, I, my first job I went to, I went to an investment bank because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I wanted to go to the smallest place where I found the most diverse amount of bright people. And I went there and there's people that I was in charge. I became in charge of recruiting the kids out of college to be part of the analyst program. And the people who came and stayed are now, you know, in leadership positions on the firm 20 or 30 years later, whatever the time period is. So if, if you stay with an institution, right? And part of that comes with bureaucracy and other things, you can grow and you get the power and leverage of that institution. If you go onto the entrepreneurial track, you're a little bit more on your own. You're, 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 you generally will start smaller. You won't have the scale. You may not have the respect. You may not have the platform. There's a high rate of failure on one level, right? And it's very hard to, to navigate. It's a one-way street, in my opinion. You can go from the institutional to the entrepreneurial. Very hard to go from the entrepreneurial to the institutional. So think through that a little bit. Um, in general, you can try by starting an institution. You can get training. Um, a lot of the more entrepreneurial ones didn't have the patience to stay because you kind of got to be in your hierarchical element and there's limits to how far you can grow. Um, and so, but, but no, no one really framed it for me. I, that's a lot of advice I give friends, right? You have to have a high degree of confidence that you can be an entrepreneur and you can go out there on your own. It's hard. It's just hard. Um, it, um, it's great, but it's hard. Okay. So I think, I think uh, that's some of the, the lessons. And my only advice to you when you're in, right, for those of you that are on the Yale campus today, just make sure you're devoting as much time and energy uh, to the students and other community members that are there, not just in the School of Public Health, but across different functions as you are in the classroom or the work that you're doing. At the end of the day, the classroom and the work that you're doing, in my opinion, is not as meaningful as the conversations that you have, the stimulation of the ideas, the formation of your thoughts, the self-reflection of what you want to do, understanding different pathways and opportunities. I mean, the great thing about, about Yale, and, and Yale is a privileged institution, but, but, but it's true of mo many different schools, but especially at Yale, is, the, is what makes it special is the, is the student body. I mean, the great faculty create an environment to attract great students and the students are, are your peers will push, inspire, motivate, reflect what you want to be and not want to be. And I just would spend and devote a lot of time and energy to, 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 to meeting everyone you can. Right. So getting back to that question from earlier, the network does matter. And it's not just about networking, but it's about just learning from each other and the co and extracurricular activities that you share. Um, I'm going to ask my last question because we're going to run tight on time. 
But uh, one of the reasons that I've even come to know you is that you've both been generous with Yale uh, during the pandemic, as was mentioned earlier in the conversation. Um, what has COVID taught you and what do you see as um, the role of entrepreneurship and, and philanthropy after we get past this pandemic? And I'll start with Roger this time. Again. Well, I mean, there are many thoughts of COVID. I, I, I don't think there's a new insight from COVID. I think it's just bringing to the forefront things that we know, right? One, time is precious, right? You, you just don't know when something comes out of the blue and disrupts everything for everyone. Um, and uh, that's number one. Number two, health is central to human existence. Without it, we don't have anything. So those are things that we're aware of. I, I you know, I've devoted the last 16 years of my life to health. So that, that, that was an easy one that I was activating. I think the time is precious. You take for granted a little bit, right? Uh, uh, so I think that's a healthy reminder. Um, uh, human connection, the importance of it. How do you foster it? How do you create it? When you don't have it, you kind of recognize that that, that, that it's important. With respect to health entrepreneurship, I mean, again, there, the, I think what COVID has done in every business is accelerate the transformation to the digital world by at least five years. And that acceleration is permanent. I mean, I'm still working at, we're, we're reimagining every aspect of our business and we create community with people. And we're now really thinking hard about how do you create community online? But I think, and there's a question in the chat about digital, the, 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 the concept that, you know, you carry, oh, sorry, you carry your this with you, okay? It, it just, and, and you wear this thing, okay, uh, on your wrist. The, the, the data that's collecting, the comparison, like, it's, just, it's just endless. And now how do you disseminate things efficiently? How do, how do, you, how do you get information? And, and information is key in healthcare, right? So the, the, the opportunities for being an entrepreneur in today's world of health are greater than at ever at any point in time because we are entering this digital phase and analog companies are super slow to transform. It's just a function that, that very few companies are truly nimble to go from one business model to another one. So the, the embracing of, of digital is so important and so transformational that people start digitally native in their thinking and their concepts and their delivery mechanisms and everything are just able to take advantage and move into the marketplace for, further and make a greater impact and create more entrepreneurial opportunity. I agree, Chris. Yeah, I, uh, I would say it, it taught some new things and kind of highlighted um, how philanthropy has to sort of work. It's sort of a mixture of many uh, things. I think the biggest thing it taught us is to be flexible. Um, it was an immediate crisis. You need to step up right now and push dollars out the window right now. Um, so you kind of have to almost put us, you know, we put aside some other long-term things that we were sort of just, you know, chugging along on um, because the, you know, food banks needed major dollars, right? Small businesses needed major dollars. So kind of shifting uh, over there. So being very flexible, which isn't data driven, by the way. So, uh, and that's an, another important point. It's great to be data driven and in philanthropy, but sometimes you kind of have to throw that out the window and just sort of adapt, move and like shove funds out, out the door. Another reason why you know, we're fairly skeptical on the giving pledge because the data shows, and there's data on that one, not enough money is actually going. It's being pledged, but it's not getting out there. It's like one percent. Bridgespan.org has a, has some great information about that. We need to, you know, get the money going right uh, right now. Um, that said, there are certain areas where data is super important in, in the pandemic and in other areas. And I'm going to borrow from a phenomenal organization called OpenPhilanthropy.org. Uh, I really recommend you guys checking out that site. Great information about how to be an effective philanthropist, but. You know, they give the example of, uh, you know, people that want to focus on animal, uh, you know, safety or, you know, animal, animal rights. And they use the example of, you know, there are 30,000 times more animals in factory farms than in animal shelters. Yet animal shelters get 50 times the philanthropic dollars. 
So that's a kind of very simple data shows like, what are we doing here, right? So I think that's important uh, to think about. And then uh, finally, uh, and this again, open philanthropy has great information about this. Don't forget about policy as philanthropy. Uh, and I'll give an example in California, we got a big fire crisis. So we gave $100,000 to the folks behind Proposition C, which was gonna give $20 million to Marin County for fire uh, prevention activities, right? $100,000, and that was almost the entire campaign. The thing won by like a couple hundred votes because I had two thirds. Okay. And that is worth $200 million. So it was $100,000 uh, drove $200 million to the public sector to fight fire, the fire crisis. So don't forget about policy as philanthropy, as well as things like talent. That's another area. Uh, it's not money, it's, it's getting talent in the right places. That's great. I think we're going to open it up now to take some of the questions. And since all of our panelists can see the questions, um, I would ask you even to look at which questions you might want to answer because I think they're all good. Uh, and I'll go with, uh, I think Roger's been paying more attention to the questions than Chris. So I'll go back to Roger and give Chris a chance uh, to look at other questions and turn it over to Roger. And then uh, I'll let Fatima and uh, uh, Fatima, sorry, and uh, Kave also chime in. Well, first, let's make a call out for more questions, okay? Because a number of them, we've answered them about. I want to answer the question of luck. Somebody asked the question of is uh, is is luck to do with your success? I have a I have a very clear perspective on this one. Um, there's nothing better than luck, okay? Luck is awesome, and most people who create sort of massive amounts of wealth or something, there's a high degree of luck on top of great skill sets and all that. You just have to be in the right place at the right time to be able to do that. But I, I really believe that, that part of what can be viewed as luck is, is being able to recognize a moment and being prepared to do so, okay? So I, I, was, I was in school until I was 27 years old. Um, and I'm grateful that my parents helped provide an education for me. I had an opportunity in a lot of different summers to try a lot of different things. I worked in different countries and I did different activities. But when I saw an opportunity eventually, right, I, I was able and ready to jump in. And I went from the institutional side to the entrepreneurial side. So you, you have to, you, you have to, you have to keep looking and experiencing things, but 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 you, you have to have that moment, like build up your skill sets, learn as much as you can, and then 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 keep your eyes open that you can kind of run. So in one way, it's lucky that things got I got exposed to it, but I, I also try to just continuously be out there. So and you can make a certain amount of your own luck. Uh, and then, you know. If the if the if the gods of fortune shine upon you, uh, accept the uh, accept the gift and embrace it. Um, so um, I just that was just the one question that I didn't address yet. If you don't mind, maybe I'll ask one question that I see, um, and it's the role and contribution that the academic community could um, uh, contribute to health entrepreneurship. Uh, right now. Um, colleagues at Yale are having a very active conversation about what we can do about climate change. And I'm just wondering whether you have any experience or thoughts about the role of academic community in uh, responding to, to climate related issues. Yeah, I, I think it's yeah, so, so important. Um, so as I started getting into climate change and started kind of going down the rabbit hole and just you know consuming just tons of information, but most of the information was from universities, research centers. I mean, just this amazing work that academics had kind of, you could tell they slaved over it. And then you know, they put these hundreds of pages of, you know, just tremendous work online that you can get at your fingertips is like insanely helpful, right? Um, and then you, you feel like you can get smart enough about something and then reach out to some people cited in those, in those studies. So that's tremendously helpful. That's how we, we kind of got, went down the path into um, you know, carbon mineralization, which again, I think is, is an area we really have to focus on. And again, that VCs are sort of shying away from, again, back to that idea, there was another question about how do you know, you know, you should ignore the advice of, of experts. Well, that's one where, look, really smart people, but 
look, there's some something that they're afraid of for the people they're raising money for that they're shying away from something that's so obviously the key part of the answer. And academics can really help highlight those those areas. Academics can help in things like you know direct air capture, right? Which it also has this weird kind of anti-politically motivated thing because maybe oil companies are too interested in it, so therefore it must be bad. Right? You know, that's something academics can can shatter that notion, right? So that's that's really important. And then finally, um, love to see academics working on in the field more closely. You know, and again, back to fire suppression, big problem out here in California. Um, we've now gotten you know UC Berkeley involved with the private sector trying to come up with new devices for warning people about incoming fires at the micro level, right? Because it's a big problem, false alarms. And they're working with the, 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 the fire, the county fire chiefs. So you've now got, uh, and, and individual philanthropists, you've got some really interesting people in the room, each brings a different perspective. That's how magic happens, right? That's how real innovation happens. And that's just great to see. I'd love to see like, you know, hundred X more of that going on. Fatima, do you see some questions you want to bring up? Can I can I address the climate sure, one as well? Absolutely. Um, so, the, the academia can can provide. Like our company was the first in the world to offset our carbon emissions to have zero carbon footprint. We did that in two thousand. The science at the time it was more instinctive and intuitive rather than the science of it. Then we got into this whole debate between is climate change real or not climate change real? So I think the bringing the science that Chris was saying, but I, I wanna push academia. I mean, again, I wanna, I, I feel that my, my conversation when I first met Stan and I, I think the school has been doing a, 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 a good job on improving on this is, is delivering the science and doing the research and not communicating it broadly is that old sort of Descartes question, is a tree falling in the forest and no one hears it, did it occur or not? And I think what happens is that the role is critically important about these research and these nuggets. But I think instead of having to get somebody like Chris to have a team of people dig through all the research to find the nuggets that are relevant, I really think academia and I encourage everybody, you know, on this on this Zoom, has to understand how to how to communicate and disseminate the idea. And and you have to embrace social media. You have to embrace the tools of dissemination of information that are that are relevant in today's world. And you have to figure out how to get influencers of time to adopt. The, the science, the research and all that, you have, to, you have to deliver them in sound bites to make an impact. And the old days of doing scientific symposiums and you know the whole metric of success is publishing in peer review publications that nobody reads. I, I don't, I'm gonna be a little harsh about that. People do read them, but at the end of the day, the world is being influenced by, um, I call it internet science and communications. And we need, you, academia needs to find a way to start to communicate broadly. So for those who are in policy roles, it's not enough to come up with the policy ideas or do the really insightful research. You have to understand and work and partner with people who can broadcast it in a digestible form that like is you know, available for mass consumption. That'd be my push. Thank you for that. By the way, if people have any um, things that they're looking at businesses at, at, at all that, if they were to send it to somebody on this from 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 um, Kave, who would they send it to? And maybe Chris and I would look at them, you know, if they're interested. Uh, you know, I, I see something from a, w Wendy Price is doing something which is trying to create community online. I think it's very fascinating. I'd, I'd love to get a sensibility of some of these ideas that people are doing um, just to understand it. And perhaps it could be of interest that we could help support without making a blanket commitment on the phone. But I, I you know, I, I'd just be wondering if you could gather them and share it with, with, with us later. We will absolutely do that. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, um, collect those. So thank you, uh, Chris and Roger for that generous offer. So if you're listening and you're interested, you have an an idea if you want to share um, 
a brief scope of your idea and send it to my email. I'll put that in the chat. Uh, feel free to do that. Yeah, but and, they just have to agree to ignore our advice. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's going to be the test, everyone. Um, so, and it's so a Roger, Chris, any last words before we wrap up? Be, be optimistic. Things are, things are trending well. Uh, I just uh, want to say that everybody who's listening to this is likely in, the, in, in, in one of the most interesting dynamic places to be where you can have the dual benefit of making change um, and, 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 and helping people and, and create business opportunities at the same time if you're doing it. So um, thank you for your dedication to this. The pre and post COVID world and the field of health is um, transformational. It's like pre and post internet in the world of you know, existence. And I think, I think the acceleration of all these trends just means what you do is important. So um, uh, I'm sure somebody and a number of you that are watching this are going to create stuff that didn't exist before that are gonna make a real difference, whether it's on the policy side, on the administration side, on the entrepreneurial side, on the innovation side, like just go for it, you know, it's, it's worth it. Um, and, 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 and then just try to think of sustainability. How do you sustain it over time so that you don't have to keep asking to have others believe and support you the whole time? Like go, go try to create that, but I'm, I'm excited to watch what you do. I want to thank the, the, the Yale School. I want to thank Chris, my, my friend, for being on this. It's um, great listening to him. I always learn when I, when I do that. And I want to thank Innovate Yale for, for existing. I think this is a, truly a distinctive feature from the public schools of public health. I think it's an awesome opportunity that we should scale and get more people involved in it. And I'm um, just grateful for I believe everybody who's part of the Yale you know, School of Public Health is doing it for a reason that they're inspired by the mission uh, of the school is to make a transformational impact. Take advantage of the resources of Yale at large. Like, you know, there's a fantastic set of people in SOM and the law school and the medical school and the, and the environmental school studies and, 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 and undergraduates. And everybody will want your engagement because right now you're the center of the universe. Um, uh, which is how it should always have been, but now it finally is. So um, good luck with everything and thank you for the opportunity to talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, thank you Chris. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.